Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. So today's talk is by Peter McGrath, and he will talk about symmetry and isoperimetry for Riemannian surfaces. Please go ahead. OK, well, first, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers, and uh, in particular, Armin, for the invitation. Uh, and I'm, I'm very happy to be giving a, a, a talk at a, a very nice uh, joint seminar via Zoom here. So today, I'd like to tell you about uh, some work that uh, about half of it was done by myself, and then the other half subsequently, uh, more recently, with my co-author, uh, Joe Hoisington, who was a postdoc at the University of Georgia. So I, I want to begin with a very classical problem. Um, so let me back up just one more moment. So if you do have a question, just feel free just to unmute yourself and just ask, because I, I have given talks on Zoom be before, but I can't see basically, I can see only a few people. So if you have a question, just, just interrupt me. Um, anyway, so I'd like to begin with uh, the very classical isoperimetric inequality. Uh, which begins with this sort of fable uh, Queen Dido's problem. Um, so the, as the fable goes, uh, Queen Dido uh, wanted to purchase some land uh, to build the city of what eventually became Carthage. And uh, she was told that she could only purchase as much land as she could fit uh, between the hide of an ox. So she was able to cut up the hide of an ox into essentially a piece of string and then wanted to enclose uh, with this string the largest possible area. And so as we know, uh, we can work on the setting of a constant curvature surface. If we have a domain that has a smooth enough boundary, and the boundary length A and the area A enclosed of the domain, we can quantify the solution to this problem uh, via the isoparametric inequality. So it's in Euclidean uh, on the plane, we have always that uh, the length squared minus four pi times the area is uh, bigger than or equal to zero. And we have equality if and only if uh, the domain is a ball. And so if we work in one of the other constant curvature model spaces, the round two sphere or the hyperbolic plane, uh, this equality still holds, this inequality still holds if we modify the statement and add this uh, term with uh, k a squared, where k here is the, the Gauss curvature. Uh, so either one uh, for the sphere or minus one for the hyperbolic plane. So before going further, I wanted to mention some other classical work uh, from the 1920s and 1930s which uh, showed uh, in various different settings that uh, a very similar type of inequality holds uh, if you replace the, the ambient surface with one that has variable curvature if you have an appropriate uh, upper curvature bound. So some of these results were due to Andre Vey, uh, Beckenbach and Rado, uh, Boll and Fiala with some different assumptions on the, the curvature bounds. So the next question I'd like to move on to is about stability in, in the preceding isoparametric inequality. So this is also a classical topic. So essentially, the question is, if you'd like to understand uh, the isoparametric inequality better, you might like to ask what happens when you have a, a, an isoparametric deficit. So the deficit for me is this quantity L squared minus 4 pi A plus K A squared, which is close to being 0. So in the context of the preceding inequality, uh, that quantity must be bigger than or equal to zero. So supposing you had a domain for which the deficit was very close to zero, does your domain have to be appropriately close to a, uh, a disk? And so one uh, version of this kind of stability inequality or a stronger version of the isoparametric inequality that's very classical is called uh, the Bonnison inequality. And what this says is in the context of the, the planar isoparametric inequality, it says you can squeeze below the isoparametric deficit on the right hand side, this pi squared times uh, big R minus little r quantity squared. And so big R is the circumradius, so uh, the radius of the smallest uh, disk that contains omega, and R is the uh, in radius, so the little r is so the the largest r such that you can fit uh, a disk of radius little r inside omega. Uh, 
And so such an, this inequality implies there is a parametric inequality on one hand because uh, the right hand side is bigger than or equal to zero. And on the other hand, it gives you some more information because it, it tells you that if you have uh, a small isoparametric deficit, the right hand side must be correspondingly small. And then your domain has to be squeezed between uh, two very close uh, disks. So you, the boundary of your domain uh, is close in some kind of L1 uh, sense to a disk. And so Osserman uh, called such a type of inequality, a Bonnison inequality more generally, if you can put a quantity on the right-hand side called B, where B is bigger than or equal to zero, vanishes only when you are a disk and has some kind of uh, geometric significance. So as, as I go on in the talk, I'd like to explore some kind of more general uh, stability inequalities for, for isoparametric inequalities in some different regimes. So before I do that, I want to explore kind of a, a little diversion, which uh, motivates some of the, the work here. So I want to play a game, basically. So I want to try to explore uh, the symmetry of the disk and try to understand how, uh, what makes the disk optimal uh, in, in the classical isoparametric problem. So here I'm working in, in R2 for a moment. And I just like to play a game where I put, I pick any two points I'd like on the, on the boundary X and Y say, and I can connect them with a geodesic segment, a line segment, and then further take the bisector of that segment. And because the disc has the property that it's completely symmetric, this second segment I just drew is a, a line of reflectional symmetry of, of the disc. And so in particular, if I draw the outward pointing unit normals at X and Y, it's the case that either of them gets reflected over to the other via this uh, dotted reflection line I drew. And so this holds for each pair of points X and Y I draw that are say distinct. So I can play the same game uh, with any domain, which is not necessarily symmetric or not fully symmetric. So in other words, I pick any pair of points I'd like X and Y take their outward pointing normals, connect them with the segment, take the bisector of that segment, and I can ask the question, is this uh, bisector a line of reflectional symmetry of the domain? So in, in most cases, it is not, but I can try to measure the failure for this uh, segment to be uh, a line of symmetry in the vicinity of this pair of points by say, again, taking one of uh, the normal vectors and reflecting it across this line to the other. So I can take uh, the normal at Y and then reflect it about and call the reflected version R, capital R for reflection of new Y. And then now that I have uh, two vectors in the same tangent space, I can compare them, for example, by subtracting them and taking the length squared and this gives me a kind of pointwise uh, measure of the asymmetry of the domain in the vicinity of the pair of points X and Y. So if I'd like, I can further globalize this by integrating for all pairs of points X and Y and get some kind of uh, global asymmetry um, of the domain. And so you may ask sort of, what is the point of all of this, which is a very good question, the thing that surprised me is that uh, this quantity I just defined turns out to be exactly the isoparametric deficit um, of one of these domains in a constant curvature space. Um, so if you, one way to actually compute the isoparametric deficit is exactly this uh, sort of strange uh, double integral quantity where you're doing this double integral over the boundary. I should have mentioned that, that uh, in both cases, you're doing uh, integration with respect to arc length um, on the boundary. So this on one hand gives a uh, proof of the, this classical isoparametric inequality, but it tells you more because it gives you some kind of uh, extra information about the, the symmetry or asymmetry of the domain. So, Natural question. So yeah, before I go on, let me let me give a sketch of a proof of this this theorem, at least in the R2 case. So the proof of this theorem is very simple once once you know that it should be true. 
So we just calculate. So uh, if we compute this uh, length squared, since uh, both normal vectors have length one, we get uh, this quantity here. And then if I integrate uh, and use the divergence theorem, I must compute the divergence uh, of this R cap uh, vector field. And if I do some calculations, this is not an extremely diff difficult calculation. It turns out that the divergence of this uh, vector field has this uh, gradient of a logarithmic term. And then we can integrate the second time about y in the boundary. And if we do that, so first I get here, I've integrated over x and I use the divergence theorem, then I integrate over y. If I use the Fubini theorem, I switch the order of integration. And then it turns out that uh, I can calculate the second term and I get in the end four pi a, basically because on this second term here, I can try to use the divergence theorem again. And then that will get me the Laplacian of the log of modulus x minus y. And since log of r, where r is uh, distance x, my, x to y, is uh, the fundamental solution of the Laplacian on R2, uh, we get 2 pi times the delta function. And then, so we're integrating over y and then all x. So on top with the extra two we had out there, we get this uh, 4 pi a term. And so a very similar calculation uh, works if you do this on uh, not R2, but one of the other constant curvature uh, spaces. So I'd like to move on to talk first about some higher dimensional uh, quantitative isoparametric inequality results. And this result here, uh, due to this uh, trio of mathematicians, has been a sort of motiv very motivating uh, result uh, for the last 10 years in definitely in analysis. And it, it goes by the name, the quantitative isoparametric inequality. So this is, this is an inequality that holds in a very measure theoretic sense uh, for domains in Rn. So the setting is that you have just essentially a measurable set in Rn and you can normalize it so it has the volume of the unit ball. And this is another type of quantitative inequality because it has a, again, a non, uh, not necessarily zero, but uh, non-negative term on the right-hand side. So if I had just zero on the right-hand side, this would be the isoparametric inequality in Rn because it would say that the, the perimeter measure is at least as big as the perimeter measure of the ball with the same measure. So that would be the usual isoparametric inequality. They have managed their contribution is to get this very interesting uh, non-negative term on the right-hand side. So the right-hand side, this term is called the Frankel asymmetry of the domain. And so the game you play with a Frankel asymmetry is that you try to find the measure theoretic sort of ball of best fit. So what you do is you take all possible uh, balls uh, with the same uh, measure as your set in Rn, and you can pick any center you'd, you'd like. And for each center you pick, you measure the volume of the symmetric difference with omega. So you take uh, omega minus b union b minus omega, which is what's left over, what's not in common to both, you take the measure of that. So this is sort of the failure uh, of, of uh, the ball to, to intersect with your omega. And then you take the infimum of this over all possible balls. So you find the, the ball that best approximates your omega. And uh, this is what they managed to put on the right-hand side um, with, with some just a dimensional constant uh, C sub n that we've got there. So, this inequality has been generalized in various aspects, um, most notably for, for my interest here in today's talk to some uh, manifold settings. Um, so several authors in the last five, eight years have proved sort of analogous versions of this quantitative isoparametric inequality if you have domains in the hyperbolic space or the n-sphere. Uh, a very interesting recent paper, preprint, 
showed that if you work sort of in complete generality, um, if you're just looking at Riemannian manifolds, Riemannian N manifolds, a natural version of uh, this quantitative isoparametric inequality is, is false. Um, so it's, it's possible to imagine trying to generalize um, this kind of uh, statement over here uh, to a manifold uh, if you replace B with an isoparametric region rather than a ball. Um, it's sort of difficult to find a really appropriate generalization to Riemannian manifolds of that inequality because the original inequality really depends on having a canonical uh, comparison, sort of an extrinsic uh, ball, which is, which is your optimizer, uh, which in general, we don't have uh, such canonical objects on manifolds. So it would be nice to have a, a more intrinsic uh, definition of a deficit or asymmetry for a manifold. And so this is uh, where we began uh, the second project I'd like to talk with, talk about with uh, my collaborator, uh, Joe Hoisington. And so we, we look back at uh, the, this double integral quantity I defined before, and the natural question is, well, can we generalize this to uh, manifolds, to surfaces? Um, and so right now, I'd like to describe how we can do this. So let's work first on an n-manifold. And the additional assumption I require is that it's a geodesically convex, which for me here means that uh, given any two points, x and y, I can draw a unique minimizing geodesic between them in, in my manifold. And so I'd like to mimic the same construction I, I discussed before uh, and define this kind of a reflection operator. So given a distinct pair of points, I can, I can define an operator in this way. And so what I do is uh, given y and a tangent vector in the tangent space at, at y, I first reflect across the hyperplane in the tangent space, which is orthogonal to uh, the tangent of the geodesic segment that connects x and y. So first I reflect uh, vy in the tangent space, and then to get a tangent vector in the tangent space at x, I just uh, parallel translate along the geodesic segment. Uh, and this is our definition. So first reflect in the tangent space and then a parallel translate. Um, as a side remark, you could imagine maybe parallel translating first and then reflecting in the tangent space at x. This is not very difficult to see. This gives you the same definition. So uh, as another remark I'd like to make is that uh, this does indeed actually give the same definition I, I mentioned before, um, if you are working in, in uh, one of these canonical symmetric spaces. So if I have just a general uh, domain which has smooth enough boundary in one of these uh, manifolds, I can define the same integral quantity. So I can do exactly the same thing. I can uh, compare uh, the normal at X to the normal at Y by reflecting and taking the length squared of the difference and then integrating over all possible pairs of points. Um, and then I, I have this uh, one half normalizing factor as before. Okay, so one thing I'd like to mention now is that at a conceptual level, what, what this uh, quantity that we, we call this quantity, the scattering asymmetry. So this is the E cal omega. Uh, so the scattering asymmetry, in some sense, it detect, it tries to, it measures the, the failure to have uh, ON symmetry of your domain. So let me describe this just a little bit. And so I, I first claim that if I have a domain which is convex and on symmetric, then its scattering energy must be, must be zero. And so the reason for this is that for each pair of points x and y, if I am on symmetric, there is a unique reflection, so an isometry that uh, exchanges x and y and reverses the orientation. And if I, if I have that isometry, that isometry will map the geodesic segment connecting X and Y to itself, again, reversing the orientation. And then it's pretty easy to see that uh, this R cap nu Y, the reflected Y vector will indeed be uh, the, the vector at X. So you would have then uh, point-wise that quantity for each pair of points, that quantity would be zero 
So this is what we sort of think about uh, the scattering asymmetry as measuring. It's trying, it's trying to quantify your failure to be uh, ON symmetric. So the natural question is, uh, is this quantity related to uh, the isoparametric deficit? As before, as we know in the constant curvature case, it on the nose gives you the deficit. And so one of our main theorems is that uh, four surfaces and all the preceding definitions as before, we do get some kind of quantitative inequality. Um, so we have L squared minus four pi A plus the soup of the curvature over an appropriate domain omega prime, which I'll describe in a moment, times A squared. This is bigger than uh, the scattering energy, which remember is uh, non-negative. Here, the domain about which we take uh, the supremum is the union of all possible geodesic segments connecting all pairs of boundary points. Uh, so this is a natural object that comes up if you're playing the same game we did before about connecting geodesics uh, between uh, pairs of boundary points. So again, K is the Gauss curvature on your surface. Um, and as you might expect, if, we, if we're in a positive curvature case, uh, we require some kind of diameter bound. Um, so here we require, we require that uh, we have uh, this particular diameter bound. So I'll discuss this a bit later. Um, in many of these types of uh, inequalities when you have positive curvature, some kind of uh, diameter bound is uh, necessary. So I'd like to discuss a little bit the proof of this and then discuss basically the rigidity case. So something I didn't mention before is uh, what happens if uh, the scattering energy is zero. So I claim that uh, if you're ON symmetric, the scattering energy is zero. That's fairly easy to see. The converse you might imagine is that if your scattering energy is zero, perhaps then your domain should be uh, ON symmetric. Um, this turns out to be the case and I'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, so first let me discuss briefly the idea of the proof of uh, this theorem. And so the theorem basically depends on two ingredients, the first of which is an explicit identity uh, for this scattering energy. So the lemma is that the scattering energy is exactly equal to this L squared minus four pi A times this uh, another double integral quantity. So this double integral quantity notably is over the interior cross interior. And I'm integrating here uh, one over this uh, g squared of x and y, which I'll explain in a minute, times uh, the product of the Laplacians of r, where r is the distance between x and y. So when I say Laplacian sub x or Laplacian sub y, what I mean is that you can consider the function r, which is the distance between x and y, that's a function of two variables. If you fix one of them, say fix y, you can consider them r as a function of x, and then you can take the Laplacian of that function as usual with respect to the X variable. Alternately, you could do the same thing, regard R as a function of Y for X fixed, and then take the Laplacian with respect to Y. And it turns out in this identity, uh, the product of those two things uh, comes up. Let me also mention what I, meant, what I mean about this uh, root G squared notation here. The notation looks a bit odd, but uh, here the root G is uh, just the volume density function. So in other words, if I fix uh, say X and then write locally uh, my metric in polar coordinates about X, so I've got dr squared plus a function squared times a d theta squared, I call that a function squared uh, root G squared. Um, so it's, it's basically just uh, the volume element. Um, so it turns out uh, this is sort of uh, uh, one of those well-known facts that I, I didn't know uh, before uh, working on this, that uh, this root G is actually symmetric in X and Y. So this is not uh, extremely difficult to see, but uh, it's very useful to know. Okay, um, so how do we prove this lemma? So basically uh, the sketch of the proof is very similar to the proof I described before the calculations just end up being uh, different. So if, if I calculate as before, I'd like to compute the divergence of this uh, vector field. And it's possible to compute the divergence of this vector field uh, because we can, it turns out, write out this vector field uh, very conveniently in uh, the system of polar coordinates. 
and then basically just compute. So after I do that, I get basically another function and then this uh, strange uh, term here, w, uh, which is the one over root g plus uh, this Laplacian. Uh, so what I can do then, if, if you sort of remember the sketch of the, the proof from before, after I would integrate with respect to y, I would want to use the divergence theorem again, this time with respect to y. And so I'd like to compute the divergence of now this uh, vector field with respect to y. If you do a little bit more calculation, you get a delta function like before, and then you get these two other terms. And these two other terms are then uh, responsible for uh, this uh, second integrand. And again, I'm integrating over the, bound, over the domain twice because I've, I've used the divergence theorem twice. So that's the idea of the lemma. If I want to move on to uh, the proof of the theorem, I'd like to start from the lemma and then try to estimate uh, the remaining double integral. So if you recall from what I'd like to get out, so what I'd like to get out from here is a term that has something like sup k uh, times the area squared. So if I can bound uh, pointwise uh, this integrand, the one over root g squared minus the product of the Laplacians, if I can bound this in terms of the curvature, uh, then I can just uh, soup it out and then I'll be integrating a constant over the uh, domain cross the domain, that will give me a constant times the area squared. So I'd like that constant to be related to the soup of the curvature. So what we'd like to show, uh, it would suffice to show that on any of the geodesic segments connecting a pair of points X and Y in the interior, that uh, this strange uh, quantity here, which is the integrand, is uh, pointwise bounded between uh, the soup, say, and the inf of the curvature along that geodesic segment. So that would suffice. And it turns out that this is something we can do. Uh, this turns out to be very manageable with uh, standard uh, comparison theorems. Uh, so as you might imagine, we use basically just the Laplacian comparison theorem and the Rauch comparison theorem. So the Laplacian comparison theorem will, will take care of this product fairly well. And the Rauch comparison will take care of this one over the root g squared. Uh, and this is where having a diameter bound is uh, helpful. Uh, the signs work out in such a way that uh, we can indeed bound this by the, the soup and the inf of the curvature along the segments. And that basically gives us uh, the theorem once we can do that. So I should mention this small technical point. Um, so if I just go back to the statement of the theorem I had here, so this is the diameter bound uh, we required here. Um, we suspect that this diameter bound is not optimal. Um, so we suspect that the optimal diameter bound would be if you could erase this two, basically. Um, that would be the case where the diameter, in, in the case that you uh, have, say, the curvature being one, um, this would be telling you that the diameter would be uh, basically a hemisphere that you should be seeing basically a hemisphere being, being the um, sort of critical case. So it would be nice if we could uh, figure out how to improve that. Um, so in essence, figure out a better way to estimate uh, this quantity or really uh, this uh, double integral. Okay, so I'd like to talk about uh, two more things. So the first, is related uh, to the L1 Sabalov inequality. Uh, so let me briefly uh, discuss this from a, a different point of view to begin with, and then try to re relate to what we, we've discussed before. So the, the version of the Sabalov inequality I'd like to talk about, so I'd just like to talk about a smooth compactly supported function on R2. So Sabalov proved that there's some constant C such that you can bound always uh, the L1 norm of the gradient of F. Uh, you can say that's bigger than or equal to constant times uh, the L2 norm of F. Um, so these inequalities have uh, been important in PDEs. 
starting, I think, around in the 1960s, people started to ask uh, what the optimal constants in these inequalities were and if there were extremizers. So if one could find an optimal constant, uh, could one also find the functions f which uh, achieve equality in the inequality with the optimal constant. And so in around 1960, uh, Federer and Fleming, and I think also independently uh, Mazia, answered this for, for the inequality I have above and the corresponding versions uh, in Rn. So in R2, the smallest constant C turns out to be one over root four pi. More importantly, the extremizing functions turn out to be the characteristic functions on disks. And so to explain more what that means, there's a very kind of helpful analogy, which is essentially what these two groups of mathematicians discovered between the Sopolov inequality and the isoparametric inequality. So I said that the extremizing functions are the characteristic functions on disks. So it turns out that uh, this sharp sopolov inequality is equivalent to the isoparametric inequality. So if you believe that this uh, smallest constant is one over root four pi, and that the functions achieving inequality are the characteristic functions on disks, what you can do is you can essentially recover the isoparametric inequality. So if you, if you take f to be the characteristic function on a disk, you'll see that the L2 norm of f is essentially giving you the area or I think the square root of the area because so if f is the characteristic function on your disk, it's one on the disk, you integrate uh, f squared, that gives you uh, just the area you take the square root uh, to get the L2 norms that gives you the square root of the area. On the other hand, if you compute the L1 norm of the gradient of F, so F here is the characteristic function on a disk, so it doesn't have a gradient in the usual sense. On the other hand, you can make, uh, make sense of this uh, in the sense of uh, functions of bounded variation or in some distributional sense. And there the gradient you can think of as a, essentially a delta function supported on the boundary. And so if you integrate that, uh, this will essentially give you uh, the length. Um, and so if we square both sides out, the isoparametric inequality pops out if you believe that this constant is a one over root four pi as I claimed earlier. It's also possible to deduce uh, the other direction. So in other words, uh, deduce this inequality if you know the isoparametric inequality. I won't discuss details there, but this follows from a sort of standard uh, argument using uh, the co-area formula. So I think Federer and Fleming and uh, Mazia basically discovered these uh, two facts uh, in tandem. So I'd like to mention uh, a proof of this uh, Sobolov inequality using the technology we described before However, not actually using uh, this isoparametric inequality I discussed before. So it turns out we can give a very simple, completely direct proof of this Sobolov inequality using this reflection operator, uh, just extremely simple. So what we do is I'd like to compute the L1 norm of grad F uh, squared. And I can do that by writing the L1 norm uh, twice once with variable x, once with variable y, and then uh, bring one integral in, inside the other. Then I can use Cauchy-Schwartz. Uh, so I can say then that the length of grad f with respect to x times the length of grad f with respect to y is in fact bigger than or equal to this uh, inner product where I have the, the grad f with respect to x here and the grad f with respect to y here, but notably uh, actually the R operator, the reflected version here. So this is okay from the point of Cauchy-Schwartz uh, because the R operator is an isometry, so it doesn't change lengths. On the other hand, if you do a couple uh, sort of intricate calculations, again, using the divergence theorem, it turns out that this middle integral is exactly equal to uh, four pi times the L2 norm of f uh, squared. Uh, and so this gives kind of a, 
a very nice proof of the Sabalov inequality. We were actually kind of surprised that, that we were able to do this. I think for me, the surprising thing is that we get exactly the sharp constant, which as before I mentioned, the only functions which F, which actually achieve the sharp constant are functions which aren't actually smooth. They're these characteristic functions. So it's, it's maybe a little counterintuitive that you can uh, just by doing, you know, simple integration by parts arguments, get the sharp inequality with the sharp constant, which is, you know, achieved only for sort of functions in the limit. But if you sort of chase through how Cauchy Schwartz gets used, you'll see that uh, the characteristic functions of balls are really the only candidates where you could have equality in your uh, Cauchy-Schwarz for all pairs of points x, y. Uh, this is essentially because the, for the characteristic functions, uh, the gradient is zero almost everywhere. And the place where it's not zero is uh, supported basically on uh, the boundary and on the boundary of a disk. It's the case that again, your reflected uh, gradient of f with respect to y is equal to the gradient of f with respect to x. And this is what you would need to achieve equality in the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. You would need those things to be parallel for all pairs of points x and y. And we're integrating for, for all pairs of points over the whole domain. Uh, so that places a lot of restrictions there. In any case, we can get a corresponding version that I haven't alluded to here, as you might imagine, uh, for surfaces. So there's a, Sobolev, a similar Sobolev inequality uh, for functions on a uh, curved surface. And uh, we have that also in our paper, but uh, we don't uh, state it here. So I'd like to go finally now to the last topic I'd like to mention so earlier, I addressed briefly, I raised the question of what should the domains be which have this uh, vanishing scattering energy. So before I said that if your domain is uh, ON symmetric, your scattering energy is zero. So the natural question is, should the converse hold? In other words, uh, if you have zero scattering energy, should you be ON symmetric? And so we show that uh, this is true essentially when you have uh, dimension two. So if you have an actual surface, um, we have to add this uh, little extra annoying hypothesis about having uh, no conjugate points on the boundary. Um, so with that assumption, uh, we show that the converse does hold. So if you have zero scattering energy, your surface is actually O2 invariant. So this theorem is not actually we thought this theorem would, would be sort of trivial to prove at the beginning. Um, and it turns out that uh, it seems somewhat challenging. So it's, it's not too difficult, but we use an extremely difficult and powerful uh, theorem of pestoff ullman from, from inverse problems. So what's called the boundary distance rigidity theorem for surfaces. So to describe this, I wanna mention uh, some extra notation so I want to mention two different types of distance functions. So if I look at two points on the boundary of my domain, I can do two things. So one, I could think of those two points as being on the one manifold, which is the boundary, and then measure the distance in that one manifold. So this I call R super boundary. Um, so that's the distance between the two points in the one manifold. So in other words, the distance along the boundary. Uh, I can also consider uh, the distance function of the usual domain, the full domain, and then just restrict it to pairs of points on the boundary. And so this, this second function, so I just happen to have two points on the boundary and I take their distance in omega, that's called the boundary distance function. And so our goal in proving that this uh, a domain with zero scattering energy should be rotationally invariant Basically, for a reason I'm about to mention, it would suffice to show that this boundary distance function itself is uh, quote unquote rotationally invariant. And what I mean by this is that if you take two points on the boundary X and Y, you measure the boundary distance function, and then you uh, rotate X and Y, you move X and Y uh, simultaneously at a constant speed, 
uh, along that curve, your boundary distance function does not change. Um, so if we could do that, we claim that uh, we would be basically done with the proof of this theorem. The reason for this is this very strong theorem. So this was an annals paper for a problem that was, I think, open for about 30 years. So Bestoff Ullman proved essentially that uh, if you have a nice enough manifold or nice enough surface, this is a strictly two dimensional theorem. If you have a nice enough surface, that isometries of the boundary basically extend to isometries of the interior. Um, and so this is what we would like to exploit. Uh, so it turns out we can do this and it's not so difficult for us to show that, that this uh, boundary distance function is uh, rotationally invariant. Uh, the condition that uh, our scattering energy is zero, uh, this quantity that uh, r cap of nu y is equal to nu x for all pairs of points, we can basically apply some uh, first variation arguments. Um, so we can take a geodesic segment connecting x and y and then do a variation of that geodesic segment or different types of variations of that geodesic segment by alternately moving x and y along the boundary. And then if we uh, play around a little bit, uh, we, can, we can conclude this uh, goal we had here. And then basically the the pestoff ullman theorem does the heavy lifting for us and, and we can conclude the theorem. So that's basically all I wanted to say about this. Uh, the one more remark I would like to say is that you may be wondering, uh, so the scattering energy I defined in general for N manifolds, um, all the theorems we have, or the, all the theorems I have written here are for surfaces. So there's two ways to explain this. So one is that uh, if you compute kind of the lemma that we did before, which has a formula for the scattering energy, you can still do this in higher dimensions, but it doesn't seem to be related to isoperimetry. Uh, sort of the, the dimensional analysis required um, just works out differently once your dimension is no longer two. So in our paper, we've written a couple things about uh, computing this in higher dimensions, but the higher dimensional case seems to be less interesting there. On the other hand, the, the rigidity question still seems like it should be very rich in higher dimensions. So one could ask uh, the version of this uh, same theorem that I wrote down here. So can you prove this rigidity theorem when your dimension is not two? Uh, this we don't know how to prove, uh, mainly because this uh, pestoff ullman theorem I mentioned here only has a satisfactory version in dimension two. So if you replace uh, the dimension two with something bigger, in general, it's completely open. So uh, there, are, there are some kind of uh, partial results. So for example, if you know your metric is, your metric on mega is uh, analytic, I believe the kind of pestoff ullman theorem holds. I think it also holds, I mean, it's been known for quite some time that I think if your metric is Euclidean, this is uh, true. I think also if your metric is uh, hyperbolic, or I think, there's, I think there's some theorems that say if your metric is very close to being Euclidean or very close to being hyperbolic, you still have this boundary distance rigidity. Uh, but those are still uh, very much partial results. So it would, be, it would be nice either to be able to find a proof of this result, which doesn't depend on the pestoff ullman theorem, which sounds difficult, or to have a more satisfactory version of that uh, pestoff ullman theorem. But we would conjecture that uh, the sort of n-dimensional version of this rigidity theorem I stated earlier should still be true. So that if your scattering energy is zero, you should be um, O-n invariant. Actually, I should qualify that. Uh, I certainly believe that's true. I, I don't wanna speak for my uh, collaborator without, without having uh, spoken with him about this. So I think maybe I'll stop there. I think this is the, yeah, that's the last uh, I had prepared. Um, so any uh, questions?